Welcome on the stage, Sarah Kunst, uh, who is the managing director of Clio Capital. Uh, Sarah, are you coming on? Um, she is, as, as she comes on, I will, here she is. Uh, she's the managing director of Clio Capital and um, named a future innovator by Vanity Fair, uh, recognized in Big Business Insider as a 30 under 30 women in tech, top African American in tech, Forbes 3030 and all star alum, pitch book, top black VC, honored as a top woman of VC by the Wall Street Journal, lots of accolades, uh, at, and, and justly so. Uh, Alina Bassi, you want to come on stage? Uh, Alina is uh, a chemical engineer turned entrepreneur uh, with a passion for sustainability. Uh, as she comes on stage, uh, she founded Clyderly. Here she comes. Hi, Alina. Hi, uh, <laughs> so she founded Clyderly uh, to solve the problem of textile waste and turned into plastic, which is super cool. Um, and recently awarded the Forbes 30 under 30 recognition in the manufacturing um, uh, um, industry category. And uh, finally, I want to welcome Lisa Marie Fassi. Lisa Marie, come on. Uh, come on down. <laughs> uh, uh, she's worked in the European tech space for eight years and now um, is running uh, Female Founders, which uh, which is Europe's fastest growing community for female entrepreneurial minds. There she is. Hi, Lisa. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Hey. Um, so Lisa, I want to I want to start with you uh, because uh, to address the the wild statistic that, as you know, only 2.8% uh, of women are VC, uh, uh, women founded companies are VC funded. And, um, and I, I guess I'm wondering, is the world missing out? Well, certainly the world's missing out. We know that. And it's a it's a, lots of moral questions around that. But just purely economically, um, is the world missing out on a huge economic opportunity? Um, so thanks for having me, first of all. And I think the answer is pretty simple. It's a big yes. Um, so, I mean, when you look at governments or at countries that have done a lot in terms of diversity, their main motivation was this economic perspective, right? So when we look at Sweden, for example, where they're so far in this topic, because they realized that actually when women work, they pay taxes. So it's good for the whole economy and it's good for society. So yes, we're missing out on very big opportunities because as a lot of statistics actually show, that women led startups, women led companies, not only startups in general, but also the big, uh, the big corporates do perform better economically and also in terms of developing a culture and having a positive social impact. Sure, absolutely. In fact, um, you probably know this, but women founded companies exit faster, right? And also, according to Harvard Business Review, um, if women and men participated equally in entrepreneurship, the GDP would actually go up uh, from uh, $2.5 um, trillion dollars to, to $5 uh, trillion. So it sounds like a huge economic impact. Um, Sarah, I wanted to, to turn to you um, in terms of... Um, whether whether you think that we should be spending our time convincing more, I say, white men uh, to invest in women. Obviously, there's huge economic opportunity. Where should we really put our efforts here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's should kind of go everywhere, right? In in America, um, about 30% uh, of the population are white men. Um, but in terms of who controls capital, you know, that number is well over 50%. Um, and so while I everybody uh, to to who has money to invest it equitably and invest it to your point where you see the best returns we know that diverse teams drive better returns you know that there there's some people you know let's let's focus on people like us because they're more likely to give us money and the reality is that you know i think there are only like five black billionaires in america and there are a lot more than five black or white billionaires in america right so for me um i'm interested in who has capital and how do we get them to deploy it more equitably um and that that is sort of my focus and my goal. And candidly, those are often, uh, you know, the white men are often the people who who have the most money, who can sort of write the most checks, um, and who historically have done the least in their careers to build a more equitable world. So 
I think it's very reasonable that they should be at the table to to help fund everyone. Sure. No, understand. And how about um, women themselves? It seems to me that uh, most women are that I know, uh, well, maybe not in my 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 close circle, uh, but that they spend um, a lot of money giving to charitable causes, um, but probably less money in terms of investing in in companies, particularly um, female founded companies. But well, what's your take on that? Me? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I think that it's unfortunate. There's a stat that women, and again, this all my stats are very U.S. focused. Um, there's a stat that women, you know, control the majority of capital uh, or will in the next kind of 10, 20 years in terms of women tend to outlive men. Um, and so therefore, as baby boomers, you know, die off, uh, the, the women will inherit the money. But the reality is, right, and I can tell you this both data driven and anecdotally, um, it's the men who control the money. I have a list, a, quite a long list of very prominent female billionaires um, who, when you dig under the surface and see who controls their money, it's men. Um, and the, the thing that I always say, and I mean this in like the best way possible, I used to work at Chanel, is if you can afford a Birkin, right, you can afford to angel invest. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, and I love Birkins and I love angel investing. And so like do both. And, and so I think that sometimes women who very much have the ability to write those checks, right, are not. And I think it's a, a mix of nurture versus nature. But I, I also think it's similar to politics where often women have to be asked multiple times to run before they'll run. And I think it's the same thing. If you know a woman who owns a Birkin, you need to be asking her why she's not angel investing. And if you ask her enough time, she'll probably start angel investing. And, and for those who don't know, I had to look this up after our conversation. A Birkin costs between ten thousand mm -hmm. U.S. dollars and like two hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? So mm -hmm. um, I do not, however, own a Birkin bag. <laughs> um, but but we should probably say, Sarah, that that I am an LP in your company. You are, you are, um, yeah, yes. You've been an investor in my company and now an LP in my fund, and I very much appreciate it. No, absolutely. Um, and maybe I traded off the Birkin bags for this, but mm -hmm. I'm <laughs> obviously a big worth fan. it. Um, Alina, I wanted to turn to you because, um, you know, speaking with you as a founder of a super interesting sustainable company, um, I wanted to, Clyderly, um, I wanted to, for you to share a little bit of your experience, what, what it's like to have been um, raising or should I say trying to raise um, from VC or from, um, from, from anybody actually. Sure. Yeah. It, it's been an interesting journey. Um, so. I come from a very different background. I come from an engineering background. It's very, very technical. So initially the, the, the first hurdles were quite difficult because I had to um, make these or get these warm intros into VCs or into, into investors, having you know gone to lots of events before COVID and met a lot of people. And, and so that journey in itself took me many, many months just to start having these conversations, having these first chats or getting these warm intros. Um, I've been really lucky that, that I've had a lot of investors who really believe in what I'm doing and the, the vision for a, a circular economy and taking textile waste out of landfills. Um, but even then, I think that that whole period of time of just, just first getting to know people within the scene takes really long. Um, I don't come from the sort of background that might have you know, connections to angel investors or VCs, or maybe people don't necessarily know about that within my personal network. So I felt like I was really starting from absolute scratch, trying to build my network within Berlin or within Germany first, also coming from the UK. Um, now I think um, I feel much more confident in, in the whole um, journey. I think I've understood now how I need to present myself uh, to investors. But to be honest, the first few discussions I had, I was told I'm too honest um, I, and that investors expect me to inflate my numbers. So the feedback was, don't be so honest, which, which was really shocking. You know, as a scientist, or as an engineer, I'm so used to, you know, this is it. These are the numbers. This is how it is. And just being really realistic. And so this was a huge learning for me um, that this world just works completely differently to, to my background. Did you end up um, raising or did you, where are you in your fundraising? Um, so we decided to pause. And the reason is because we've got a lot of traction that we would like to be able to prove. So go to market as soon as possible, get get that done, prove the traction that we have, 
because one thing I learned is LOIs are from extremely large brands are not enough. Um, but that could be in the time of COVID. It could just be that, you know, people are less um, uh, risk averse at the moment. Um, so we've decided to completely pause the whole um, investment run, focus on traction and then go back to it next year. Right. I also realized that momentum is a very important part of it. And if you don't have the men momentum to keep going, then it's best to just pause and uh, give it some time. Sure, no, understood. I'm curious about the statement of, of women not, um, if the, that you should inflate your numbers. Um, Sarah, what's your take on that, uh, on, yeah. on inflating numbers? Well, we don't like liars, um, so, so it's not it's not that. Um, the way that I often see it uh, is that you know women will say, um, you know, hey, our annual revenue run rate is um, two million dollars, right? But what's buried in that number is that the first half of the year they were doing maybe a hundred thousand a month, and then that other million, or, or all, and then now they're doing like double or quadruple that, right? So what we don't want do is say, you know, I made this number up, it's a lie, please don't check my books. <laughs> what we want you to say is, hey, we had you know, last three months, last four months, we've seen, you know, 500% um, month over month growth or, you know, so it's, it's looking at what you're doing and, and it's saying, you know, what, what is what is the best like what is the most flattering thing that I can say about this right so think of it like when you have a stomach flu and you're like I have felt absolutely horrible for three days but I fit into my jeans like let's find the positive right <laughs> and, and so that's the way that I would encourage it and it's also to your point something that that men do tend to do more consistently so when women don't do it you know men don't say hey here are my you know, here are my press spin numbers and women don't say, hey, here are my deeply realistic, like sort of downplaying myself numbers. So when I as an investor look at two companies in a similar space and one on paper is telling me that they're doing much better than the other one, like that gets hard. And I know enough to generally push back and be like, hey, like, let me understand a little bit more about this on both sides. Um, but not every investor does. And, and there's so many things sort of stacked against us that when there is something like that where we can, you know, sort of even that playing field, I think it's really important to do so. Um, and then the other thing I'll comment on, Alina, is you you mentioned sort of building your network to know investors. Um, I'm going to drop a link in the event chat um, to a company that I recently invested in called Lunch Club um, that really works to solve this problem. It's an AI digital networker. You can use it all over the world. Um, and it exactly goes to, to that problem, which is what do you do if you don't just already know a bunch of people who are happy to give you money? Um, and the answer is, especially right now in this COVID world, you go meet them, right? You find them on social media, you find them on Clubhouse or Twitter or whatever. And then you can also find, use things like Lunch Club where you, know, you can explicitly meet them. Um, and I think from there, it, 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 be, it this di current digital moment massively levels the playing field um, in terms of being able to meet more investors. Right, that's super interesting. And Lisa Marie, are you finding that um, it's a similar, you know, that 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 women entrepreneurs are are facing similar challenges in raising um, VC money or, or angel investing? Um, definitely. Maybe just just one comment on what you said, Sarah. Um, I, I totally agree that women are constantly underselling themselves. And we're also running a startup accelerator for companies from across Europe. They have to be female-led, so there needs at least to be one female co-founder. And they actually learn to pitch and sell the positive aspects about the business from the very first session and for three months. And this is really a continuous process because they are so realistic and they're just so honest about what they're doing. And actually, I think that's a good thing. And I think you really need to find a balance in this whole startup topic between fitting into this man's world because actually the startup community here in Austria, here in Europe is basically a boys club at the end of the day. But I think we need to find a balance between this fitting into what it is right now and actually changing it to really have this gender agnostic um, ecosystem where it doesn't matter if you're a man, if you're a woman, if something um, else. So you just, you basically are yourself and you can say whatever you feel comfortable with. So I think this is going to be one of the biggest struggles that we will see in the ecosystem um, to actually foster this diversity topic. But yes, so even from my experience, I've, running the, I've been running the biggest angel network for angel investors in the past four years and worked on the European level with startups and angel investors. And I can tell you stories that are just horrible. When women enter the room and when they start pitching and it's mostly guys on the other side of the table or in the audience, um, and there are really things happening that are just horrible. You think uh, that such, as, such as what kind of things? 
totally discriminating. Like being like, hey, um, shouldn't you take care of your kids? Shouldn't you be at home? Is it okay for your husband to be out uh, during the night and pitching these things? And also when you enter the negotiations with investors, a lot of them are actually happening, you know, after work. Um, and this really leads to situations that are just uncomfortable. And I think no one should be put in this situation to feel uncomfortable because when you feel that way, you of course feel uncomfortable in this whole position and you just can't be your natural self and can't be this person who sells the company because apparently you feel like it's not about the business anymore. So it's not about fact, it's not about raising money for your companies, but it's about you as a woman. And uh, yeah. I, I think we should really find solutions for that. Yeah, no, in fact, um, funnily enough, um, I when I raised money for one of my first companies, um, I remember being together with a male investor and he was so obnoxious and so unpleasant that I literally walked mm -hmm. out after five minutes. And uh, but, you know, then again, I had I, I was very privileged because I didn't absolutely need the money. And I know, Alina, yeah. when I spoke with you, you had a similar um, uh, experience. Yeah, and now uh, after hearing your experience, I wish I'd kind of done something similar. Um, but I wasn't in the position to say um, I'll leave this call. Um, but I think I think it's all about building your confidence as well, and kind of learning. And like a scientist, you know, it's an experiment. You keep trying and you try new things, and eventually you get better at doing it. Um, but the first time you do it is probably the most difficult because. As you all said, it's all about you. In the first round of raising, it's about you as a founder. And um, I think sometimes the difficulty I have found is, um, you know, this being a very technical, um, you know, solution that I've built. Um, I, ha I, I feel, sort of feel as though I have to first explain my entire CV of I've worked as an engineer, I've done this, that, the other. And that's the reason why I'm the, the person to do this. Um, so I, I sort of try to prove myself a bit more um, to get that credibility so that when when I'm asked questions, um, I can explain that I know this because of what I did before. Right. It's the old adage that, you know, um, a white investor, a white male investor will look at a look at somebody, a founder, a white, white, you know, white kid founder and say, oh, you know, he can do that. You know, he looks like me when I was younger. And then a woman, it's like, what did you do? You know, how can, you know, how do I know that you can, you know, execute and, and grill, grill, grill. Uh, Sarah, when I spoke with you um, earlier, you had talked about the grit that's needed um, for, for women founders um, in terms of taking, um, I guess you said hundreds of meetings. Can you talk about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the one thing to keep in mind, and I have this conversation with people a lot, is they'll be like so frustrated, especially women and people of color who've taken, you know, 20, 30 meetings and no end or reach out to, you know, 20 or 30 um, people and, and who angel invest and nobody has been interested. That's totally normal. That is totally normal. It is if you've not been um, turned down by 100 people, then you probably haven't pitched enough people. And that's true for almost everyone, right? That That is, you know, if, if when it comes to race and gender, maybe you're going to have 200 or 300 people, which, you know, but everybody gets turned down more. I, you know, you Susan, probably have these stories too. I know so many people who, when Travis Kalanick was starting Uber, told him that he wanted $25,000 from them. They were, you know, multi, multi-millionaires. He was like, they're like, no, 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 right? So if the broiest of all tech bros who goes on to build the most valuable private tech company, you know, in the US and basically world ever has a list a mile long, people who refuse to give him $25,000, like rest assured that you too will get turned down a ton. And all you have to think about it is great. If 50 people turn me down, then that means that I'm that much closer to getting a tech because at scale, it's a numbers game. I would say if 100 people won't even take a meeting, then I would step back and say, is my pitch okay? Is this like a terrible idea? Like it, it I would say for every 25 to 50, um, you know, people that you inbound who you know are actively investing in your region and sector, um, you should probably get at least one who wants a little bit more info or, you know, who wants to set up a phone call, right? So if you if you've reached out to 200 people, and absolutely none of them are interested, you might want to think about, am I doing something wrong? How could I make this more appealing? Um, but if you've reached out to 25 and no one's responded or no one's liked it yet, then like keep going. Okay, that's great. Lisa, um, I'd love to, you know, take a second and talk a little bit about the new model for investing um, for women that, that you're creating. 
Yeah, um, so on the one hand side, it's going to be this classic PC model, um, focusing on female adventures. But we also thought, because this is just where we come from, basically, and something that is um, very much connected to what we want to do in driving this positive impact, it's um, at least 1 million euros that is coming from um, individual women. Um, so they can start investing at small ticket size. It's probably going to be around 10 or 20K. Um, and it's going to be connected to an educational component, because I think one of the biggest reasons why women don't invest, not only in startups, but in general, when we look at the numbers, is this lack of education in terms of investment. Because as you mentioned, Susan, we have no problem with actually donating money or giving it to some charitable causes or buying Birkin packs. Um, but apparently we have an issue with investing it. But it, I think it's just a lack of confidence and a lack of knowledge and being afraid of doing something wrong because we just, or just a lot of women don't know how these things work. And I think there's such a quick fix and such an easy solution to this by creating confidence and giving them the knowledge that they need and also a platform where they can discuss with other people who are basically doing the same, who are also beginners in this investment process and where you can ask the most stupid questions that you can possibly imagine. They just feel comfortable to actually ask them because in a round of men, and that's what we experienced at the Angel Network, women don't ask these questions because we feel like, okay, what will other people think of me? Um, and so we need to create this sort of atmosphere of trust and this network of trust where people actually start doing things and ask and just get things done and take risk. Right. That's great. And I totally agree that taking risks. In fact, Sarah, I'd love to turn to you in terms of, you know, you were a founder um, and invested in, as you said, your your previous company and then became an investor. But um, it seems like failure risk, um, you're you just go for it. What's uh, what's the what's your your secret sauce? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's not really much else you can do, right? You you try things, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, and you know you learn a lot from it kind of either way. Um, but I, I think if you're someone who is very bad at failure and you don't like to fail, you want things to be always good, um, you're probably better off not starting a company because you'll fail at something, right? To go back to the Travis Kalanick example, apparently he's on my mind today, um, you know, <laughs> He built the most valuable, one of the most valuable private companies in the world and then got fired, right? And so he has like a bajillion billion dollars, but he still got fired. And so, you know, that is, Steve Jobs got fired. You know, that's pretty normal, right? Is Mark Zuckerberg doing a good job? I don't know, right? So the reality is, even if you succeed in the startup world, um, it might not feel that way and most people don't succeed. And so if you have, and I think culturally as well, and like very American in that, you know, we just sort of try something, doesn't work, you try something else. And I've spent some time in, in different European um, startup ecosystems and I do really to push back against because if you succeed at everything you're doing, I would argue that you're not taking big enough risk. Um, or you know you are you have a crystal ball and you can see the future. In which case, just buy lottery tickets. Why are you doing a company? <laughs> so if you're not if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. I think yeah, if not failing occasionally in something, you're not trying hard enough. Right. No, I think that that's a great thing. And I have to remember the the Birkin bags. Uh, that uh, what was it? If you're if you can afford to buy a Birkin bag, or the angel invest. Yeah. You can, exactly, exactly. Um, we have two, just a couple of minutes. Um, Elena, can you, you want to just talk a little bit about a second about your tech and color venture? Absolutely, yeah. So um, basically, um, a friend of mine and I, um, Deborah Choi, she's the founder of Porticure, uh, we did the Google Female Founder Program, which was absolutely fantastic, building this power network of 20 awesome women who all, always encourage each other and support each other. But we realized what would that sort of look like if that was now a group of women from ethnically diverse backgrounds who have similar backgrounds to us, but also don't have these warm intros to investors. So we decided to um, actually team up with Google for Startups, Techstars, Silicon Alley and London and Partners to um, actually um, provide a way to match make investors with women from these ethnically diverse backgrounds. So now they get their warm intros through us. That's wonderful. And it's called uh, techincolor.org. So if you go on there, you can sign up as an investor or as a, a founder of color or as an ally. 
Fantastic. Well, I wanted to thank you all for appearing on the panel. It was super interesting. And uh, remember not to buy the Birkin bags and to invest <laughs> in female founders or um, venture invest, uh, uh, be an LP as I've done with um, Sarah's fund, uh, where the world uses more needs more women investors, whether they're angels or LPs. So thank you all for, for taking the time to, uh, to, to join us today from, I guess, all over the world.